for today. And uh, this will allow me to introduce to you guys um, Anthony Tomaro. He is the partner in charge at Grassy and Co and Company Consultant Services. He has over 30 years providing accounting and management consultant services. Um, Tony specializes in, in M&A. He has a, a lot of specialties within, within M&A um, between healthcare, technology, and, and, and other areas that I'm sure Tony's going to share um, with you guys. Um, he has held different positions in, in the C-suite, working with privately, private equity groups to run and realign some of their portfolio companies. And he's also a member of the Certified Accountants Certified Public Accountants and the New York State Society of CPAs. Um, so Tony, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Um, I'm looking forward to your talk and I'm sure it's gonna be very enlightening for, for our guests here and members here today. So um, Tony, um, let me just give you, you should have an opportunity to share your screen. Let me just make sure, sure. you can do that if you wanna, uh, I believe you have, you have a deck that you have, wanna present to the folks. So welcome, the floor is yours, Tony. Sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Colin. Thank you for allowing me to, uh, to, uh, to be here. You actually make me sound impressive, but um, you know, as, as some of my friends on this call know me, I'm not that impressive, but you know, it's, uh, it, it's fun to be here. Thank you. Um, so uh, like Kyle said, I've, I've been around for a long time. Um, you know, I, I, I've sat on both sides of the table from a, from a consulting perspective. Uh, I've also been a CFO or CEO of companies where we did mergers, we sold and we bought. So it's, uh, you know, I've been in the trenches of, uh, of, of everything, but now I get to play uh, on, on the other side where I help uh, help clients and um, they're, they're looking to do a transaction, right? So I'm not going to solve all your problems today, but I think it will, will highlight some of the things that uh, I've personally been through uh, in, 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 in the sell side and buy side. Um, so, you know, first we'll talk about the timetable. Uh, and then we talk about some of the do's and don'ts. Um, and then I have a couple of uh, actually live cases that I've recently gone through. So they're, uh, you know, we're, we're going to protect the innocent because they're clients of the firm, but um, I can give you sort of a sense what transpired during these transactions. So, you know, the, the first question is when, when we meet with the, with potential clients and uh, nothing against attorneys, but uh, you know, the answer is how long does it take to sell your company? It depends, right? There's uh there's no, uh, there's no magic bullet, you know, there's no, there's, there's no right answer. And, and you'll see later on the, the gap it takes to sell a company. Um, you know, we have companies that sold in eight months and we have companies that took two and a half years to sell. So it's, but obviously there's always a reason for that, right? So how long does it take to, to sell your company? You know, in a perfect world, if I had to put a, a, you know, some of you may agree or disagree with me, uh, but I'm thinking anyway, from six to nine months, is probably like a, a fair time frame. Uh, I see Amy shaking her head, so I have one person that supports me. Um, but again, that's sort of something that you want to throw out there six to nine months, assuming uh, the, the world is perfect and, and all the stars line up, right? So uh, that's sort of the first thing I wanted to, to chat about. Um, talking about some of the do's of selling your business, right? There's, uh, and this is not all of them, obviously. Uh, I just feel like these are the ones that uh, I've been part of, um, uh, certainly, you know, there's other things that you have to consider, but I wanted to sort of highlight, you know, some, some of the ones that I've, uh, been, uh, been through. Um, it was great last week, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Miller spoke about, you know, the first one goes to the, the psychology of selling your business, right? Um, you know, be mentally ready. And I think that's where it's important to have, um, to have somebody sort of to coach you, right? I mean, this is, um, and I, I mentioned this before, the company's your baby, right? You, you've, been, you've been growing this baby from, for 40 years now, or 30 years, whatever the number is. It's, it's, it's very personal. You have a lot of people uh, 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 dependent on you. you. You have a lot of mortgages to pay. You have a lot of car payments. You know, our, our managing partner, Lou Gracia, always says, you know, the, the pressure that I have is that I have 425 mortgages to pay every month. So, it's uh, it's uh, it's a lot of, lot to bear. So you you have to be ready mentally to 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 go that route. And you know, having Dr. Miller on 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 some of these projects, I think looking back, will probably would have been um, would have been a plus, right? So uh, certainly plan ahead, right? We we have clients that uh, clients of ours now that basically wake up one morning and say, hey, I, I want to sell my company. Uh, and it's not that easy, right? There's, there's, there's planning involved. Uh, you know, you have to, 
you have to figure out where you are. Hopefully, you've been represented by uh, by a, a good advisor where you know you could shorten that time frame. Uh, and one of the examples I'll talk about later on, I'll, I'll talk about about not having the right advisors and, and how it could cost you. Um, who, who do you want? Who should you sell to? Right? You know, everybody wants to sell to uh, you know a private equity group. Everybody wants to sell to a strategic uh, uh, buyer, you know, a competitor or somebody bigger than you that you can leverage the uh, leverage the, the the operations. But you know, we also tell our clients, you know, who do you have in your organization that can take over the company that you trust? Right? Um, so how about your employees? Uh, so the ESOPs, uh, we've done a bunch of the ESOPs here at our firm. They're complicated, they're expensive, um, but at the same time, they could be rewarding. I, I think the tax benefits, you know, I'm not a tax uh, guy, I know enough to be dangerous, but I think the tax benefits of, uh, of having an ESOP are, are tremendous, right? Uh, so look look at that as an option, I guess, that's all I'm saying. You know, we, we, actually, have a, we actually have a very large client we just picked up, uh, it's a $100 million food uh, restaurant group they actually sold 50% of their company to their employees. And, um, you know, we got brought in now because they're having some challenges, but it, anyway, it was, it was an interesting uh, transaction that they did a bunch of years ago. Um, you know, next one, surround yourself with professional that kind of goes without saying, you know, some of these things are sort of obvious, but you know, you want to make sure that you have a, a good fit from your company. One of the things that we see quite a bit is, uh, you know, companies over the years have gone from, you know, a $2 million company to a $60 million company, and they're still using, you know, their 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 father's friend as the accountant, and he comes in once a year, writes up the books, you know, you get all pissed off because you have to pay all those taxes that you didn't know about. So again, you gotta you gotta realign your, your service provider with, with the size of your company. Um, the next one is obviously the biggest one, and it's got a lot of different moving parts. Uh, again, I just listed some of them. Um, you know, get your business ready, right? Get your house in order. And what does that look like, right? And I kind of listed some of the things that always pop into my head when, I, when, it, when, we take, uh, when we take on a new client, right? Or they're clients of ours, and we have to get them to that place. You know, financial statements, uh, you know, it, it's an obvious one, right? You, you want to have at least three to five years Preferably audited, you know, audits are not, uh, not, not cheap, they're expensive, but, you know, there's a return on investment when you're ready to sell. Um, you know, the, the buyer has a little bit more, more confidence in the numbers. Um, but um, again, if you can't spend the money on an audit, at the minimum, you want to have some sort of reviewed financials. And, we, and that's a whole different service of accounting, accounting that we do, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, Quality of earnings analysis, the next slide I'm going to kind of walk you through real quick what that looks like. Uh, that's actually the, 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 the recipe to the, you know, to the, to the sole thing. You know, that's sort of one of the most important things you want to have. And, and even if you don't have it, you should have one and kind of update it, even maybe every year or every six months, just kind of to see where you are. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that, what that means. Um, you know, be operationally efficient, right? You want to be lean and mean because, because uh, again, you want to maximize your, your profits. You want to make sure your EBITDA is where it's supposed to be. It makes the transaction that much easier when a buyer comes in because, uh, you know, the buyer is going to come in and they're going to do due diligence on you. They're going to look at your uh, operations. They're going to look at your HR department. They're going to review your, your uh, agreements that you have in place. Uh, so you want to have that already because it just, again, it cuts down the time of, uh, of the transaction, right? You want to do it within that six to nine months window. You don't want to be doing it in two and a half years, which I'll, I'll talk about later on. Um, uh, again, as part of the being operationally efficient, we, you know, we also look at the HR departments of our, of our company, of, of our clients. We look at their IT infrastructure, you know, we'll deploy uh, some of our IT guys in there look at their cybersecurity, say if they've been attacked, uh, what kind of uh, firewalls do they have. Uh, we put a report together to make sure they understand what they're up against. Again, the buyer is going to find this out anyway, so might as well be uh, be ahead of it. Um, uh, agreements. We talk about you know having having your agreements, uh, you know having having your uh, your eyes dotted and your T's crossed. 
So it was good to have, uh, you know, a dog grow on your team to look at your employment agreements, uh, what kind of outs you have if you were to sell the company, um, you know, make sure that that's all in place. Uh, you know, seven and eight, these are, these are sort of, um, you know, number seven is uh, kind of goes with the psychology of your company, right? You want to have, you want to have a, a realistic number in your mind, right? We've, uh, we've actually turned away some clients, um, uh, which, is, which is always hard to do because their expectations of the value of their company was so far apart to what uh, they thought they were going to sell it for, right? They thought they, uh, they invented, you know, the new vaccine. And then we, we basically tell them, this is what we see in the market. These are the multiples. We, we probably can get you, you know, a, a number between what you're asking and, and what, what the value is. But there's, there's, you know, we don't see you going down the path of getting, you know, 15 times multiples or 20 times multiple. So we kind of get that up front because we don't want to waste our time. We don't want to waste the client's time and their money. So we, we're, we're very realistic when it comes to these kind of situations. Um, again, the last one kind of goes without saying, right? Be, you know, be transparent because the, uh, the due diligence process will, will, you know, everything will come out pretty much. These, uh, if you're dealing with a private equity group, they will deploy a team of guys that will sit in your conference room, you know, six guys, and they will just throw stuff at you all day long. So be prepared for that. Uh, this, I got to see those on the bigger, uh, bigger deals that, that we've done. So it's, uh, listen, they're nice guys, but I have a job to do. Their job is to find what's wrong with your company. So they can, uh, they can say, you know, we're not going to pay you 10 times. We're going to pay you eight times because your IT infrastructure is not in place and we have to spend $2 million to fix it. So just a, just a heads up on that. Um, I, I'll stop for a minute here because I don't want to I don't want to just uh, dictate my slides. Uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You know, don't don't, don't uh, feel free to jump in. I want this to be interactive because I think some of the, the members on this on this uh, panel <clears throat> have been through transactions. Uh, and you know, if you want to share any uh, horror stories, any any good stories, you know, jump jump right in. I don't want to steal the show here. Everyone's good? Okay. Uh, we mentioned the quality of earnings, right? Uh, this is sort of the, this is like the, where your dollars, this is how you figure out what your company's worth, right? So this is an actual client of ours. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I took the names off to protect the innocent. This is actually a transaction that just, just closed uh, two weeks ago, actually. And, uh, this particular company was acquired by a very large public company. So uh, you could just imagine the, the due diligence this company had, a, had went through. This is a seven billion dollar company that acquired them, and, and when we started dealing with them, uh, you know, we we had to put our uh, our A game on, right? So, uh, oops, sorry. Hey Tony, do you so mind anyway. um, increasing the um, zooming in there? Sure. Sure, sure. Uh, I don't know how much I can do it. Let me just see. Uh, and there's, just so you guys know, there's an option. If you go to view options at the top of your screen, you can also zoom in as well on your, on your end. There's an option to in, increase, uh, increase the slide. Sorry, guys, ladies. All right. Let me see. Uh, I'll try to increase it a little bit. I don't know how, how good it's going to be, but I, I don't want to bore you with the numbers. I want to I want to bore you with the concept of this this analysis, right? So, <laughs> so we all uh, listen. A lot of a lot of companies that we deal with, they all have audited financials. Some of them have reviewed financials, and you know they're great. They give them to the bank, and, and I know we have a bank on the phone here, so hopefully I don't scare them. But um, but they but they know this. This is not a secret. Uh, so just to give you a quick highlight, the top part of the spreadsheet essentially tells you, okay, this is uh, the first three columns. This is what the company reported on their financial statements uh, that they've been got. They went to banks, they went to you know credit uh, the credit facilities, and so forth. What we do is uh, what we do is really we scrub the numbers, right? We really dive into the numbers and we start looking at every single expense and we try to figure out what discretionary spending are in there. Uh, that you know are not really not really business related, or these are expenses that they're not going to go forward once the company gets sold, right? So this is a you know we call these are the addbacks, right? 
So this company happened to have, you know, some, some significant ad backs. A lot of them were business related. Uh, you know, the New York Jets tickets, right? Those, that was a business expense for them. They had, they took out clients, but you know, the new owner, uh, they may not want to buy jet tickets, right? So to, from our perspective, you know, we add that back into the, into the net income because we, those are things that are not going to go forward. Um, so we look at all those things. We look at all the, the personal items. We look at the things like this particular company happened to own a lot of real estate. Uh, so they were renting uh, their operations from their own uh, real estate holding company. And they were not charging market rent, right? So now here's a company that comes in and says, well, hold on a second. If I buy your company and I need space, uh, my rent's going to go up because you're not charging yourself market rent, right? So those are things that we have to consider. So we make adjustments for that. The, the one thing that we found with this company, they, um, uh, they, has, they had a really great year. Um, I guess it was... Uh, I guess it was 2017. They had a very big project with the MTA, right? And we knew for a fact that that was not a recurring project. That was a that was a one time. They made a lot of money on it. Uh, wasn't going to be recurring. And we knew that the buyer, when they did this analysis, they were going to find those numbers, right? So we make sure that we we got ahead of the curve. So we essentially pulled out almost a million nine of of income there because that's not going to go forward. So again, we look at everything that goes on in a company at a very detailed level to make sure that we understand exactly what the sustainable EBITDA is, because that's what the buyer is looking for. They don't want to buy what's on the financial statements, because a lot of times that's uh, it's not re- it's not reality, right? I hate to say it. I know these are audited financials, but um, it, the, the the reality is, is these numbers when you do all these ad backs. So um, again, I don't want to bore you with this, but if there's any questions on this particular analysis is uh, I'm happy to, to, um, to expand on it. And uh, Kyle, is there any questions you want me to address or should I move on? I don't see any questions here in the chat. So I might want okay. to move on. Uh-huh. Okay. So no, can we talk to, I said the sure. question. Well, I was just really curious. I mean, I get the Jets tickets, right? That the business owners would be keen yeah. for to eliminate expenses. But when there's a big income from a one-time only transaction and you're taking it out, do they freak out? Uh, initially they do, uh, yeah. of course. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and we had, a, we, had a, we had a long conversation uh, with, the, with the, there was two, uh, two owners in this company. So I had to have that tough conversation uh, but you know what? They're smart people. They get it. They get it. I said, listen, you don't have to take it out, but I'm going to tell you right now, the, the buyer is going to find it. You know, this is a, a, a public company that will, will find, you know, uh, how much you spend on toilet paper. So, yeah. um, it, it's not, it's not a pleasant, it's not a pleasant, uh, conversation, but again, we, we, we want to be uh, realistic and, and not have any surprises. So uh, to, to your point, Amy, uh, we are in the midst of a deal right now. Actually, we got an offer came in from, from one of our companies. Um, but this big opportunity, the seller had, um, he uses American Express card for almost everything. And American Express gave him $20,000 back <laughs> of, of you know, cr- credit back um, to him yeah. for, for, for purchases made. Um, and essentially we have to take that out because that that's not that's not 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 true not not true income so to your, to your point amy there's some income that you have to uh, accommodate for as well that's not ongoing business income or or expense rather mm-hmm. yeah you have to bite it's, the bullet right yeah yeah i think it's really tricky and um uh with respect to the expenses like the jet tickets for example you don't you know you, you definitely don't see that this year or last year, but I remember back in the day where the entertainment budgets were so large. And I used to think to myself, well, you know, isn't it recurring because, but for that, you know, entertainment, then all those things that are going on, would the same level of business be conducted, you know? And And so, you know, does the new owner need to come in expecting? to maintain those things in order to maintain the relationships. Like I used to think about that. I know yeah, it's not, yeah. you know, a numbers game, but I used to wonder. 
Because, yep, you know, yeah. what, what would justify the expense in the first place if it wasn't what was helping to maintain those relationships? Correct, correct. Listen, when, when we go through these numbers, it's always, uh, you always have to sit there and say to yourself, you know, is this black and white or is this just a, a, gray, a gray area, right? So it's yeah. uh, certainly, it's, uh, there have been a lot of conversations over these numbers, trust me, with, these, with this owner. But uh, you know what? They got the transaction done. They got what they wanted uh, and they're happy. So it was, uh, it was a good transaction. So uh, moving on. So we talked about the, the things that you should do uh, in, in getting your company, you know, selling your business. Uh, the, the don'ts of selling your business are, Although they're not as long, they're, they're probably longer, right? So uh, again, I just wanted to highlight some of the things that um, that I've come across with and I had experience with. But uh, and some some of these you look at them and say, well, like the first one, don't choose the price, choose the buyer, right? Uh, listen, we we all want to maximize our dollars, but I, but I can tell you that a lot of times we've seen buyers, uh, I mean sellers, uh, even though they were getting the money that they wanted, they, you know having to deal with the buyer going forward, especially if they were going to roll some equity, meaning they were going to keep a 20% stake in the company. And they knew they had to work with these groups going forward. And, and, and maybe the, the, the experience of selling the company was not pleasant. Uh, and once the new owners take over, it's probably going to be even more unpleasant. So uh, this is a tough one because we all want the highest dollars, but you know, consider who the buyer is also. That, that, that's all we're saying, right? Um, so in the next one, you know, this is another tough one. This is where the psychology comes into play, right? Don't, you know, the idea, if you're selling your company is that you're going to go and, uh, you know, play golf in Florida somewhere. So, uh, and you want to be able to do that. So don't make yourself irreplaceable, right? Um, we, um, we, you know, we see a lot of this and, you know, the, the current, the, the recent transaction we, we just finished, the, the owners were ready to, to, you know, to move on and enjoy their lives and travel the world. And, uh, but at the same time, they, they're, they're still involved. They have relationships that need to culture and that they need to transfer over to the new owners. So uh, you want to find that, that balance where, uh, you know, you're, uh, uh, sorry, it says join audio. Uh, I'm assuming you can hear me all. I got a weird message on my on my uh, screen. Anyway, we, we so, can see you in here now. Yeah, okay, we can great. Hear you, Tony. Uh, great, great. Um, the, the other one, you know, we talked about this before. You know, hire, hire the right professionals. Don't do it on your own. It's it's not it's not an easy process. And and by the way, you want to focus on your business. You don't want to focus on dealing with with attorneys and 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 the buyer. You know, you you want to have you want to have a. Sorry, I mean I don't mean that in a bad way i mean meaning you want you want to <laughs> you want to have professionals that can represent you I, I didn't mean that that came out wrong amy uh you know have professionals that have your back that they can take care of take care of what you need to take care of and and um you know keep, and keep you focused on your business keeping it running continue to grow until you sell right uh, the next one is is uh, is, is interesting because a lot of uh, a lot of sellers don't think about this, right? Well, who's who's buying your company, right? Who, how, where do you know them from? Listen, if it's a strategic buyer, one of your larger competitors, you may know them, you may have done business with them, but if it's someone that comes out of left field, you know, I always say to my clients, let's figure out who these guys are. You know, we'll, we will run some background checks. We'll do, you know, I call it reverse due diligence, right? They're, do, they're doing due diligence on you, but you should be doing due diligence on them, right? Do they have the pocket? Do they have the pockets to, to acquire your company, or do they have to go out and, and get financing? And what if they get, you know, what if they can get financing? You know, then what do you do? You spend all this money and time, and they can come up with the with the purchase price. So I I, I like to do reverse due diligence uh, on who the buyers are. Um, and the last one is kind of, again, obvious, but, you know, sometimes sellers don't think about this. You know, what does the transition plan look like, right? How does, who's going to be running the company? You, you certainly may stay in place for a year or two or five or whatever the number is, but now you have, uh, you know, you, you own 20% of the company. So not every decision is, is going to be made by you. You're going to have, to, you have, there's probably going to be a board put in place. Um, so again, Think about how are things going to, go, going to go forward while you're still around the next two, three, five years. So those are the kind of things that you should really consider. 
So, so those are the, again, this is not all the don'ts. There's a, there's probably, you know, 30 other ones that uh, things that you should not do, but these are the ones that I thought were worth uh, mentioning to the group. Tony, we got a question um, oh, from, from Ken sure. Michelle. Ken, if you want to call sure. me to ask a question directly. Uh, when I was looking, I mean, I zero it on the numbers. It's just my natural way of doing things. But what I, what I noticed was is that they seem to be spiking every other year. I know the one year was the MTA thing. But yep. what, what are they doing or not doing during their busy times or their slow times that were causing that every other year spike? I mean, it's a, it's a, it's just a business that's very, um, so they do construction, they do consulting for uh, so some of it, the most of it is really actually new clients, right? So these are uh, new clients that came on board. Um, so if I go back here, um, you know, they, they actually introduced some new service lines. So that's, that's another reason for the spike. Um, and, then it, and, then you know, it, and then they picked up the MTA and then it went down again. Well, because the MTA was, was done, it right? Was the MTA that, yeah, as you, as you can see, it's trailing off, right? To, to almost zero in, uh, in 2020. Well, right, well, in 2019, they jumped. Correct. I'm guessing it's more new clients. New clients, new service lines, right? These these are this company is the although it's been around for a long time. Over the last uh, five six years, they introduced new uh, new service lines to, to the business. It's it's a it's an interesting business. I don't want to dwell in too much because then you figure out who it is. Okay. Uh, but <laughs> I got to protect the innocent. Um, but they, they're, they're, they continue to, to bring new, new lines to market and uh, they're sort of the uh, trendsetters of what goes on out there. Okay. Um, so, all right, so that's sort of the, that's my spiel. Now I was gonna talk about a little bit about some, some real life uh, uh, clients that we've, that we've gone through. Uh, but you, do, you mind, so do you mind is one of the questions you wanna address it real quick before jumping into the case sure. studies? So Susan has a sure. question, she asked, uh, when is the optimal time to get employees involved? Letting them know in the transition planning process. Great, great question. And we, we struggle with that one all the time. So uh, <laughs> for this for this particular one, we had we had separate email addresses for the, you know, we had that personal email addresses to the for, that we corresponded with the owners. Uh, even our invoices, because they didn't want the controller and the CFO to know yet, right? There's a time where you have to tell them, but uh, so we were actually send out invoices that had, you know, very generic des description. Uh, and, and and I hate to I hate to say this, but this is what the client wanted, right? So I had a, I had a generate invoice that essentially said, you know, consulting management services, right? Which could be anything. So when a CFO will call me up, I, I had to come up with something. And again, I hate to be the, the I don't know if I'm deceitful, but this is what I needed to do. That's what the client wanted. Um, they did make sure that their employees, the, 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 the senior level employees were protected when this happened. And the rest of the people, honestly, were they were needed for the company. So to, to me, um, you know, they took care of their, their top employees. They got uh, a bite at the apple. You know, some of them actually could probably retire because of this, you know, uh, I mean, this is the story of the, the the secretary that worked for Yahoo. She's a, she's a multimillionaire, right? Um, but uh, it, it's a delicate it's a delicate balance. You know, when when do you? That's a great question. We we struggle that with all the time. We we follow our our clients' uh, desire, right? And they want to keep it um, they want to keep it quiet for as long as they can. Um, towards uh, towards the middle of the transaction. Um, we we had to bring in the CFO and the controller in only because we were asking very very specific questions. So the owners did have a sit down with them, and and they were fine. You know they 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 pummeled through it. They they actually stepped up their game and make sure that we got everything we needed. So uh, it, it it can go it can go the other way. You know I haven't seen it, but it's uh, I think it's how you manage your staff and the and the relationship and. And I think the culture that you have with your staff, right? I think that's very important also because they, they trust you. Um, and, and, and this particular client had very frank conversations with the new owners that saying, you know, these are the people that we want to make sure are protected and, and everybody was on board. So um, 
I, I don't think they're going to be shedding many people because the, the way the business runs, it needs everyone in that business. Uh, and, and the company that acquired them, this is a new division for them. So it's, although there may, there may be some synergies at the higher level, maybe the HR department uh, and so forth, they still need these people to run this particular company. But, Thanks, uh, but, but that's a great question. Um, Definitely. So just to top it off, I'll give you three quick scenarios about things that have done well, things that have not gone so well, right? So the first one, uh, and again, these are all clients of, of our firm, you know, I'm protecting their innocence. So this is an interesting one. This particular company, uh, very sizable uh, plumbing company, $140 million. You know, they, they worked on the World Trade Center. They did some really big projects. Um, they were not client of ours. Uh, we were referred in by an attorney, I believe. Um, and they were about eight or nine months into the process of trying to sell already. Um, and the buyer, the buyer, I'm sorry, there was no buyer yet, but the investment banker uh, pretty much started walking away from the transaction because he was frustrated with the, uh, the data they were getting, the financial statements they were getting. Um, every time they got, they requested numbers, they were different. They couldn't explain why things changed. Um, and this is a perfect example of a company that uh, second generation, the, uh, and, and I don't, I don't mean to say anything about sole practitioners, you know, in my field, because they, they deserve to do what they do. And but what happened in this scenario, uh, the gentleman that was the accountant or the auditor, I should say, was uh, friends with the father of the owner. So he was in this uh, an older side. He never really kept up with the changing of the accounting rules. So he kind of did his own thing. He generated audited financial statements. Uh, and once these investment bankers started looking at them, they basically said, we can't rely on anything. You know, we're going we're gonna to probably walk away from this deal. So we get the phone call um, to come in and, and trying to salvage them. You know, it took us about a year. We had to re-audit. We had to go back and re-audit uh, four or five years, which is never easy to re go back and re-audit because the records aren't always uh, appropriate. Um, but, but we were able to do it. Uh, the owner was not happy with the fee, but we, we said, this is what's going to take you to sell the company. We've, uh, so we, we pummeled through those audits. Uh, we had to go back. We actually even, uh, we made him hire a CFO internally because the, the team that he had was not strong enough. So we, we made him hire a CFO. We worked with them got through the deal. Uh, we went through the quality of earnings analysis, you know, and they were, they had very large contracts. So we had to go back and figure out when the, when was the revenue really earned because the prior account kind of made it whatever he wanted so they could, you know, save on taxes and so defer taxes. So there was a lot of moving parts in, in, in allocating income to prior periods where it should have been picked up. So, Challenging, challenging process, but we got it through. Uh, they sold the company. I think it's been a year and a half now. Uh, they sold the company for $80 million for 78% of it, right? So they, the owner at the end of the day um, uh, did okay, but it was, it was a painful process. It was costly to him. Uh, it, was, it, was, uh, it was frustrating because we were constantly on deadlines, but, you know, we pummeled through it. So this is sort of a, a bit of an extreme case, right? Um, the next one, right? This is the the other extreme. This is this is the company, and this is actually the, the company that we just spoke before. These guys sold within eight months, and they closed during COVID. So it kind of goes to show you, um, you know, what what you could accomplish. And and these were actually client of ours for several years beforehand, right? So number one, we started speaking about this couple of years ago that they wanted to sell. So we had an opportunity to get, make sure, I mean, things were in order already, but we make sure they were really in order when they're, when the time came. So, um, you know, we had reviewed financial statements. We did all that tax returns. So every time there was a questions about the tax treatment of, of, of certain elections, you know, I had my partners on the calls. So this is a perfect example. When you plan, you have the right team. Uh, they had a good legal team representing them. Um, and, and, 
you know, I can't, can't say we didn't have any hiccups, but whatever hiccups came, they were, they were insignificant and we were able to deal with it very quickly. Uh, so this is sort of the other extreme of, the, of, of a transaction, you know, uh, doing really well. Uh, and the last one I'll talk about uh, is this one. Um, this one. This one never closed. So this is um, a, client, a client of ours, and, and I don't know, I'm not sure how this happened, but this happened because uh, even though we communicated with the client, um, they were trying to save a couple of dollars and they didn't want to bring in us into the uh, letter uh, LOI process, right? So sure enough, we get involved, they sign the LOI, we get involved, we start looking at the numbers, we start looking at the LOI, and there was some really missed uh, things that were very unclear. The pricing, the periods they were supposed to report, the, the working capital number was sort of not defined and how to compute working capital. So we, we tried to salvage it, but they, they just, the, 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 the buyer walked away. They couldn't agree on the computation of what the working capital was. And they were a couple of million dollars apart. So it's, it, was, it was sort of significant dollars. So unfortunately, never closed. So, uh, you know, I, I hate to say this, they learned their lesson because they, they, um, uh, they didn't bring us in at the right time, you know, or from the beginning, I should say. So we got brought in too late in the game that we tried to salvage it, but uh, it was it was too far gone, right? So now 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 I think they learned their lesson, and I hate to say that you, know, you never want to tell your client. I hope you learned your lesson, but we we uh, we we communicate with them um, you know frequently now, and we we as a firm you know we have a mandate with our clients that we need to to speak to them at least at least quarterly to find out what's going on. So we we set up quarterly meetings. I have quarterly meetings set up for the rest of the year with all my clients because. You want to know what's what's in their heads. You want to uh, you want to know what challenges they're facing. You want to bring solutions. You want to you want to tell them what's going on in the industry. So we try to be very proactive and not just come in once a year, do your audit, do your taxes, and then walk away. So it's it's why it's it's about the whole experience of of uh, make sure that you're serving your clients. So that's a little bit about me and, and my experiences. Uh, this is the picture that you'll find at your local post office. Uh, uh, you know. Uh, this is my marketing team. I had nothing to do with this. This is what they put me through. Um, but uh, my contact info is there. I think most of you know me. Um, and uh, that's that's my story. Thank you, Tony. I mean, um, you hit home on a lot of points. I mean, a lot of points that you hit home as far as your presentation goes. I can relate to, a, you know, a, a thousand percent. Um, Whenever we engage with a client, we want to know who's your attorney, um, who's your CPA, and who's your financial planner. We need to make sure that all those parties are on, on board and the same team because um, things can happen along the way, and we need to get all advisors on the same page just to make sure that we are rolling yeah. in the right direction. So I just want to go around um, the room here, and I want to you know, keep this as organic as possible. Uh, we all have different disciplines and different backgrounds, and we see things from a different lens from the, the, the financial advisors, we look at the different from the HR folks and, and attorneys and so on. So um, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll, I'll kind of throw it back out to the group. Anything that you guys see that stand out from your perspective that you can add add some, some validation or question or comments based upon Tony's presentation? Sure, I can start. I, I think I see we're... Doug had, well, Alan, you first, then. No, it's fine. No, okay. I, I just wanted to comment on uh, Tony's uh, start where he said the client needs to be mentally prepared. And it's not an, it's a new beginning. It's not an end. And, and just yeah. want to reiterate, reiterate how important that is. I think it's probably one of the most overlooked things. Uh, you know, the statistics for business owners that regret selling their business a year or two after are quite high. And there's a, a variety of reasons for that, but that's probably one of the big reasons. And it's certainly something I try and push out with all my clients. And it's not just the business owner clients, it's the non-business owner clients as well. Uh, but yeah, if they haven't figured out what their life is going to be like post-sale, uh, before they actually go through the process, uh, there's actually a pretty good chance it might get derailed midway because you haven't addressed it at the beginning. Right? They might have regrets already midway through the process, let alone after it. But I really do think you need to address that before you even figure out, okay, what's the best strategy for exiting and what the plan is going to be. Good, 
Good point, Alan. Good point. Uh, I, believe, I believe Doug, you had your hand up. Yeah. Yeah, Anthony. Uh, great presentation, by the way. So thank you. Doug. This is really a hypothetical. So let's assume I'm a seller, and let's assume the numbers are there, and I have these different vehicle um, vehicles that I can uh, get involved in a transaction with. So how do I decide? whether this should be a sale to another company or a sale to a private equity firm or a sale to an, e or an ESOP, you know, how, how, do you, how do you get involved in, in that decision? Um, great question, Doug. And that's, that's really, uh, you know, that's up to the owner. We, all we can do is, is share, you know, what our experiences have been. Um, listen, I, I, I worked for a private equity group for, for several years, and I was running some of their portfolio companies. Uh, I, I could tell you some of the owners that I was working with because they were still in the business. They were not really happy because of the of the metrics and the things that they had to produce on a monthly basis. I mean, they were just sort of spending their entire time generating reports and, and being bombarded with requests. And, and I'm not saying the private the, the PE groups are not uh, are not entitled to that, right? They've given you a lot of money. Um, but I also think, um, I also think it's, it, you know, it's, it's the culture, right? Who, who, do, who do you want to be in bed with? Who do, who do you want to uh, continue your, 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 your life with? Um, you know, the strategic buyers to me are always the, the, the better fit because they, they know your business. They, uh, they, you know, uh, not, not that I don't like private equity groups. There, there are times and places where the private equity is the right place to go. But I think a strategic is always better because, again, they know your business. Um, you can leverage so much more with a, with a strategic buyer, right? Because they, they probably, if they're smaller or bigger than you, whichever way, they already have an infrastructure in place that you can plug your, your, your company in and you can sort of, you know, uh, you can leverage their 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 administrative, their whether it's their office space, their their HR department, their marketing department. You know, we've we've acquired a firm. Uh, we've acquired actually two, two firms over the last eight months. Again, during a pandemic, and 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 the reason for that is so those were strategic, you know, sales on their part, right? Um, we were able to leverage, um, you know, everything, the rent, right? We, we moved them into our offices. We, we don't need to have all the administrative support that they had. Um, you know, now they have an in-house counsel at our firm. They have a marketing department at our firm, so they can grow their, their service lines. So uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's on a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, situation, Doug. But, you know, the, you mentioned the uh, ESOPs, right? Listen, if you're really loyal to your employees and you want to take care of them and you want that big, big bang for the buck, the, the tax, uh, the tax savings, you know, you should consider a, an ESOP, right? If you want your employees um, to be taken care of um, and, and, and you still get to keep, you know, some sort of involvement, right? Because now your, your trusted employees are running the company so you can you can guide them in the right place. So. There's no magic bullet, I guess. That's that's the that's the short answer. There's no magic bullet. I think it's on a case by case. Um, I I prefer seeing my clients being bought out by a strategic buyer because it's uh it's uh it's it's easier. They they play in the same pond. They know the challenges of the business. Um, that's always my first go to. Tony, we got a lot of feet. A lot of I, I think when you talk about the culture, I think that's one of in, 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 in from my experience, culture make deals happen. When you have two CEOs and a buyer to sell side, it actually get to like each other and it's a good fit. But it's strategic, even from the private equity side, if the private equity has a portfolio company and this is an add-on and a company that's going to be added onto the platform is a good fit for that portfolio. Um, if the culture and both CEOs can see eye to eye, a lot of things can happen. Um, I want to bring in either Susan or Jackie or, or, or Mark, if you want to maybe address the culture and the fit from that perspective, what, what are your thoughts are? So from my standpoint, a blending of the two cultures can, uh, if you can't blend the cultures, the new people to the old, you've got an employee problem. Uh, and that, those employee problems may not, um, may hurt 
the purchaser. So I think understanding the culture and, and, and as to whether it's a fit. For example, I was with uh, American Home Products. I was a president of one of their divisions and they were looking to buy a company. And American Home Products, it took 15 attorneys to sign off if you were to get a $10 raise for one of your employees. Um, and they were looking to buy a very loose, uh, sales oriented, not bottom line oriented. And it was a total disaster because the two cultures just didn't fit. Hmm. Good point, Jackie. Yeah. Uh, Susan, you want to say something? Or is it Mark? We'll defer to Susan if she would like to say something. But I was going to say before, Kyle, you you said you know about the the, the two CEOs talking about culture, and even if they're aligned, my concern is you know if there are people who really get their own company's culture, who really have a read on that, that's great. I'm not sure how often that necessarily happens. You know, how much is the CEO and his and his or her leadership team and other members of, of the team really connecting and communicating with one another. Um, and that whole question that Susan raised before, you know, about when should people be, when, when should uh, that the disclosure of the deal being in the works be, be shared with, with, whether it's the leadership team, this, the, you know, the highest levels or anybody else, I think that's such a crucial question. And I, and I think Tony gave a good answer, which as I recall was, who knows, you know? I, Mark, <laughs> I agree with you on culture, but that's why you need to bring in somebody that can assess what's exactly. going on as part of the whole thing. I'm not saying in any way that business owners even understand their culture. Exactly the point I'm making, Jackie. I wasn't, I wasn't negating what you were saying. I think it's very crucial how you do that who, who do you bring in who can help assess that? Who are you including in that assessment? Um, to what degree are, are, you know, I mean, part of the, the decision-making is who are the people in the company that's being sold and bought uh, are essential to the deal. And you want to engage them. You want to include them. You don't want to alienate them. You don't want to frighten them. And that's where at least varying degrees of transparency and disclosure are really important. When people are kept in the dark, and they don't know, anxiety goes sky high and people get into self-protection mode, including I, what am I gonna do next? If, if there's a deal and I may lose my job, I, I'm gonna start looking somewhere else, which can diminish the value of the, of the organization that's being sold or bought. Okay, so the only point that I wanna make is it's very complex, culture is essential to get a handle on that and how the two cultures, this is to Jackie's point, how the two cultures of these two organizations that are merging, that are being acquired and assimilated, which is really more like it most of the time, is gonna determine the success transaction in the long run. Mark, let well me, said, Mark. Let me um, I wanna get Susan in for a second, Jackie, if you don't mind. No problem, yes. go Susan. So I think what we're saying is it's important to evaluate the culture and the temperature before the marriage and to and to plan at, plan people's identities, so to speak. So I, I've seen how there's this identity thing post transaction. Well, I'm legacy such and such. And if there were the stronger company coming into it, there's this, well, we're taking over sort of thing. So from a business owner's point of view and the whole process, it's about planning out who how is this going to look? How are we going to marry functions, people, and, and having that sorted out, even sketched out so that you could have that transparency to Tony's point about being transparent through this process um, to the employees or all they'll go into the, you know, the more of the fear mode and not play in the sandbox. <laughs> awesome, Susan. Jackie's going to make a quick point. Yeah, I just wanted to say many times uh, to your comment, Susan, business owners think they will tell me that their culture is this because that's what they want it to be, that that sounds good, 
But in the reality, that is not what their culture is at all. So really getting a professional in to kind of measure and take the temperature, as you said, Susan, is really important. Oh, awesome. Um, anyone else want to want to add to the add to the conversation? Yeah, yeah. Just just to top it off, we you know we we as a firm are constantly looking for uh, merger candidates, and we probably are we probably look at twenty to thirty per year. You know, uh, our, our managing partner Lou spends a lot of time, you know, traveling the country looking for good good uh, good merger candidates, and you know out of, out of the out of the 30 that we looked at, we only, we only closed on two. So, and why is that? And, and a lot of it has to do with culture because even though some of them, the numbers actually make a lot of sense, uh, but it's, it's, I hate to say this, it's not always about the dollar. Um, we, we've actually uh, walked away from it because we, we don't think the culture is going to fit in what we have here. So, you know, it, it's, it's a tough call to make because you look at the dollar signs and, but then you also say to yourself, how are current employees going to going to uh, you know connect and, and work together with with the new potential employees? So it's it's a it's a it's a delicate balance. Yeah, I'd like to yeah, to chime in here um, because this is a, a a thing that we look at kind of all the time when we're looking at employee ownership because we we always start our analysis with what we call the goal setting and our goal setting looks at two things we look at the financial goals of the owner and then we look at the non-financial goals of the owner because what we have found is that many of the owners who are interested in employee ownership whether they come on their own or they find out about us is that a lot of times they have non-financial goals that may not they they may not feel they can meet outside um, by doing this with a strategic partner or a merger or something. And some of them have had the experience that they've sold a prior business before and had the experience of now working with like the new, and they did not like the outcome at all and whatever happened with their employees. And culture actually, Jackie, ha is a big part of um, what makes them come and look at employee ownership and then often choose that result so more of them than maybe you realize do have a sense of it and like an idea of their legacy you know as well because with employee ownership they have a lot of say so on how this new company um is formed so just just to share that and the other thing is we have a rule about when to share with employees it's not hard and fast sometimes employers share it sooner but our rule in the employee ownership transition is that you should not share this with your employees until the owner is very clear and committed to making the transition because it's going to yep. cause a disaster if he decides later he doesn't want to do the deal after all. So we have to make sure the financing is going to be possible and he's committed to doing it. Awesome. Good, good, good point, Shelly. Great point. Um, one thing I want to I want to address, I mean, the other aspects of culture is a big part of it, but there's a lot of planning involved from a, because it's a legacy as well, right? Owners are, especially for second, and, you know, even third generation companies, what's the plan? You know, is there a succession plan in place? Um, obviously, there's a, from, from, the, from the success, from the, um, what I'm kind of trying to get out here. So, you're trying to try to say a company there's a, a sum of money you're going to be collecting from that sale. What 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 is your plan with that money and how do you keep the most of it, right? Keep majority of that money. I don't know if um Bill and Al if you want you want want to address that. So the procedure to sale, what 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 what's your plan? Are your plan is to retire, your plan is to start working with a charity or, or you have new business interest. Um, and how do you minimize the tax implication as well? Um, there's a lot to play with, a lot to discuss there as well, because that could impact the potential sale too. Uh, I, I think your your point's a good one. It's 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 a matter of what the what the owner is trying to accomplish, right? Um, but in most cases, uh, they're tr they're going to have a some type of windfall. So it's a matter of how you manage that windfall. Um, and there there are a lot of different strategies you can use. There are um, there are, um, installment sales. That's, that's one way you can, you can manage 
um, the tax bite. Um, that's a that's a vehicle in which you can defer taxes um, on the sale for up to 30 years. So kind of an interesting strategy. Um, there are conservation easements that you can utilize with high net worth individuals. So just two strategies that have worked very well for us um, with business owners that are, are looking to unwind. Um, and I certainly can go into further detail, but those are those are two vehicles that we have leveraged to um, with with a good result. And Alan, what are some do's and don'ts on the exit planning side? What are some things you look at with a client that's considering a considering an exit? Alan, Thank, thanks, Bill. By the way, yeah, I'm I'm just going to reiterate what what's already been said. I think you know, uh, just tying back into the 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 talk about the culture and the fit of the buyer. You know, so planning ahead, and and basically what you know Tony said in his presentation on the don'ts is don't focus on the price, focus on the buyer. Uh, and look, it's understandable. Any seller is going to want as much money as they possibly can get for their business. But I think if you talk to most uh, sellers, they also want to see their business grow and thrive after they sell it. And that's not going to happen if they don't find the right buyer. So, yeah, it's finding that right balance of getting them the right price and then ultimately how much they're going to keep of that, uh, but also uh, the right buyer so that the, the business continues to, to succeed and thrive post-sale. Uh, Steve, um, thanks, thanks, Alan. Steve, I'm just, just to hear your your angle from a um, from a, a risk mitigation perspective. Um, I, I know you are involved in, to, in, in in commercial side of insurances. What what's what's your take on all this? Well, I mean, you know, back to what Anthony said, and you know, Doug as well. It's a matter of just getting the right advisors involved from the very beginning. Certainly, want to make sure that the owners are motivated to sell, and as the sale goes through. Mitigating that risk, depending on the size of the sale, will kind of dictate what type of insurance products. I was kind of mentioning to Anthony during his conversation, you know, um, on the transactional risk side, on some deals, um, there are coverages called rep and warranty insurance, where the buyer may want to insure certain reps and warranties of the seller. Um, sometimes the seller pays for it. Sometimes the buyer does more, more times than not. I see the buyer um, paying for that rep and warranty coverage, but it, again, it depends. Every, every deal has its own intricacies, um, but it gets, depends on the size of the deal, how the deal is being structured. Um, so I think every deal has its own kind of its own personality. Mm -hmm. That's just true. Um, Doug Lieberman, um, <laughs> at what point, I, I know sometimes I could tell you this for a fact, um, there's one thing I don't, back down on um, hiring a good transactional attorney to yourself and, 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 and Amy. Um, what, what are some things you see or push back or some advice you give the clients from a legal perspective when advisement contracts and agreements and so on? Well, I mean, cl clearly you've got to make sure that the papers, you know, the, the, the papers for the transaction set forth what they think the deal is. Um, you know, because there are definitely times where, you know, they, they tell you, all right, we're supposed to get, uh, you know, we're doing ABC, and then you get the, the draft of the contract, and it says X, Y, and Z. Um, so you just got to make sure that everything is covered, uh, and that, you know, they really are doing uh, or getting what they think they're getting, you know, and their transa transaction is as they, they think it is. Um, so that, that's always important. Um, and, and also, and I know it's, it's been touched on, but um, you know, when, when you're doing your due diligence, you really got to make sure you have the right people in place uh, to get it done and, and get it done properly and be satisfied. With it. Um, I mean, I'm involved in a litigation now because uh, there's a question as to you know, what information was given, whether or not there was anything hidden, um, and, and you know, was the deal kind of what, uh, what, what they said it was. Uh, so, and, and part of that was really the, the person who, the buyer uh, didn't have, I don't think had the right people in place to do the due diligence. He kind of did it himself. Uh, so I, I think, you know, so I think there were things that were there that he just didn't pick up on. Mm -hmm. So, but that's why it's very important to make sure you have the right people in place to do the jobs that, that need to be done. Nice, nice, it's just so true. Uh, uh, Jeff and David, I know you guys are guests to uh, a session here. Um, 
uh, in, your, in, your, in your monologue, you're talking about your active. Any, any takeaways from you guys that you, from your perspective as a business owner, um, you probably, I'm sure you probably looked at a couple of companies already. Any, any takeaways, insights you could share? Yeah, I, well, I mean, <laughs> first of all, I th think this has been great. Um, you know, and although very aware of the, um, of the culture thing, it definitely in my mind put a little bit more onus on that. Um, you know, we are kind of involved in two deals right now or working on two deals. And, and one of them in particular, the whole concept of when do you get the employees involved on our side, it's fine to let them know because we're looking to acquire, but in talking to the, you know, the potential seller, you know, they don't, they're, um, you know, their employees are completely unaware right now. It's only the owner that knows what's going on. And one of the things that, you know, David and I have asked is, or, or told him at some point, we obviously need to speak to your key personnel because they have to be on board with this whole thing. So, um, it just really brought back to the forefront to me that once we hammer out a little, you know, some more details that that's got to be the next thing on our agenda to really get him to allow us to speak to his, his key people. Is that a deal killer for you? Are you, are you flexible? At what point mm -hmm. at a negotiation, what point of due diligence do you want to say at this date, I need to speak with key personnel or what is that a deal killer for you? Or what point you need, need to be? Well, I wouldn't say it's a, a deal killer, um, you know, and it's it's kind of interesting, you know, in, in our industry, and I'm assuming it's different in all, all different, comp, you know, businesses, um, it, it's pretty common to have, you know, um, you know, guarantees um, or earnouts. So, you know, we have that right now, you know, kind of built into the deal. So in a way, the onus does go on him, the owner, to keep his key personnel, because if they leave, and his business kind of crumbles, you know, we do have uh, things in place that will ultimately hurt him as much awesome. as us. So there, there definitely is a, a reason, a, a motivation for him to keep them. But, you know, what he doesn't know, because he's never gone through this, and, and we have done a few deals, is he, he may not be realizing, you know, how big of a deal it is to bring them into the fold, to get their buy-in. Um, so we need to push him a little bit that, you know, once there's a comfort level, that really needs to be the next step. Yeah. Good, 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 good point. That's having a good attorney to draft those agreements to make sure you're protected is very important. Um, Dan, I know you're in the financing sector. I can tell you a deal that we're working on. Uh, one of our newer uh, assignments. Um, it's funny, let me go back for a second. I have a new client that actually his attorney redlined our agreement. We have a portion of our agreement that states that the client doesn't misrepresent any of their information as far as financial marketing, anything to do with their business that is, is correct and true. And he draw a red line. So that was a flag to me that I don't, I don't want this person as a client, but there, there are things that come up and some things you catch and some things are stuff that you don't catch. Um, and when it comes to, to getting SBA loans, you have to be very forthright as far as the valuation, as far as the representation of the financials. What, what are some things that you're seeing with, with First, First National Bank? Well, I, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, I think Tony hit it on the head. You got to plan for your transition, as everyone's been saying. You can't just wake up one morning and decide you need to sell. The financials need to be in order, and they need to be clear to every buyer that's looking at them. Um, the other side is we're going to ask a lot of questions. Um, so the seller's got to be willing, as Tony said, to the good, the bad, and the ugly, be able to you know represent all that's all those things as it will you know if they're prepared to do that it will increase their valuation and increase the confidence in a buyer to to follow through awesome awesome and we just approaching the 9 30 mark um so i definitely appreciate one of you guys attending i think amy had uh, a quick question about reps and warranties i don't know if um i think steve had to jump off but Tony, and no, it wasn't point? really. It wasn't really a question. It was okay. just the conversation about when is somebody brought into the deal, and when is management an integral part of the process? In that, you know, certain representations and warranties will be made in the contract, qualified to knowledge, and you know, a lot of times you're naming names, you're naming the C-suite by name that they you know, have read these representations and warranties and that they don't know any exceptions to the statements that are made or that the schedules are accurate and mm -hmm. who's preparing the schedules. I've seen a lot of wacky deals in recent years where insiders are buying the equity 
And they themselves, because they're the head of operations, are drafting the representations and the schedules on behalf of the sellers. So it's a very circular scenario in these deals that I've been seeing that, you know, if the if the seller is willing to stand behind those reps, I don't care if my client is the buyer actually in the trenches drafting those schedules. Mm -hmm. awesome. But I'm always expecting the seller's counsel to say, oh no. <laughs> and I guess I'm working with some less experienced sellers councils that they don't think about that. I don't know, but that's, I've done that, that deal twice in the last couple yeah, of years. I, I, it, it, it happens. It happens. I've, I've drafted um, those I'm, schedules myself on deals. And I could tell you that um, the sellers and the seller's attorney, oh, you are, in each case that I've done that, have always been very protective of what's in there. Yeah. So as we close off, uh, I just want to thank you guys again for attending. I uh, appreciate everyone's feedback, comments. I want to respect everyone's time so we can end on time. Um, Tony, any last, you know, 10 seconds, any last quick thoughts before we wrap up? Thank you again for your presentation. No, of course. No, I, I appreciate it. I actually have to jump on a call, but thank you for having me, Kyle. It was, uh, <clears throat> it was nice to present in front of this state group of, uh, of business owners and uh, professionals. So I, uh, I look forward to the next one. Thank you very much. And um, you guys will get a copy of the recording in, in, in a day or two, and you get information or everyone's contact information as well via email. Thank you guys again, and enjoy the rest of your day. Take Thank care, you everyone. all. Bye. Bye, everybody.